Hey everyone, so after making over 250 or probably 300 videos over the past couple years about cooking, I've definitely started to gather some opinions or preferences on either foods that I like or techniques that I use over other techniques. So I asked my Instagram followers to send me in a bunch of questions, you know, kind of spicy, opinionated questions, and I picked out a bunch of them to answer in this Q&A. Thought it'd be a fun topic. And if you are wondering if I'm just making a Q&A to, you know, make easy content, Yes, that is the case. I'm actually in the process of moving back to the East Coast. So this will be one of, if not the last videos filmed in this kitchen. I'll definitely look back on this place with a lot of fondness. But with that being said, let's hop right in. I'll have everything timestamped below if you guys wanna jump around to various questions. But let's start with Hansel, which they asked, what's your favorite and least favorite kitchen task? So for me, I think my favorite kitchen task is actually just prepping stuff. I really like dicing or slicing things. Um, one of the things that I've just kind of enjoyed, just because I feel like it's a very, I don't have to think about it and I can just kind of get in a groove. So that's probably my favorite task. Um, my least favorite task would definitely be cleaning like a, a pan or a, a, or a grill or like a, or a wire rack that maybe got like food on it and it's really stuck on there or is like annoying to get to. For example, like sometimes this thing, this is like a aluminum wire rack. Sometimes I've had, I mean, you can see, like I've got little bits and pieces in there. So that's really annoying when those things happen. Um, so to that, I would say very specific, like annoying cleaning off items. Question number two comes from Arturo and he asks, what is your favorite vegetarian or vegan dish? So for me, the poblano con queso taco is probably one of my all time favorites. Um, if you guys haven't seen that video, check it out. So easy, so delicious. Um, you know, you can whip it up in no time. I also like some vegetarian and vegan dishes from Indian cuisine. So vegetable korma, I've done that on the channel before. Um, sag paneer is another lun I absolutely love. Um, and then actually some Thai curries, like coconut curries with vegetables, also really, really good um, vegetarian or vegan dishes. So hopefully we can do some more of those on the channel as well. Um, I've definitely got some other dishes that I can't think of right now, but those are the ones that are coming to mind. Next up, Reggie asks, what is your opinion on the best French fry shape? So this is a good question, because I think I would have to say either crinkle cut or waffle fries. And that's because they're thick, so you get the potato bite, but you also get tons of crispy edges. You know, the crinkles, like they create those little edges. And then the waffle fries also naturally are gonna create all those crispy edges. Um, so those are probably my two favorite. I would say maybe a close second is like the, the McDonald's, just like the thin crispy boys. Um, steak french fries, so-so. Um, and then like, I guess potato wedges, which are kind of steak fries, is probably a little bit lower down on the list, but. Yeah, I think crinkle cut or waffle fries are probably my go-to fry shape. Next on the list, Russ asks, can you break down your oil usage? When to use, you know, avocado or olive oil or vegetable oil? And this is a pretty good question. So for me, I'm probably a little bit more simplified than most people. Um, so I really only use olive oil and peanut oil. So for me, I use peanut oil for most of my applications. So anytime I need a neutral oil, um, I'm grabbing peanut oil for, you know, sauteing vegetables or whatever. A lot of people may substitute in vegetable or canola oil here, um, but I keep peanut, I actually don't even have canola or vegetable because I can use this for deep frying as well. It's higher saturated fat, which um, helps crisp up things really nicely. And it is a neutral taste, like this doesn't smell like peanuts or anything, um, even though it is peanut oil, but if you are allergic, obviously, then you can't use this. Um, and then that's my number one oil for peanut, or for frying. And then olive oil is something that I use when I want to get the flavor of it. So maybe it's in a raw addition, um, you know, sprinkling over salads, using it in vinaigrettes, um, you know, over making a little dip for bread, or if I'm using um, it in more Italian cooking, they typically rely on olive oil to sweat down vegetables and things of that nature. So that's kind of when I'm using olive oil, but I really keep just these two on hand. And then I have like sesame oil, maybe some flavoring oils that I'll add just like a little drizzle of because that provides the flavor of, you know, whatever it was flavored by. But outside of that, it's really just these two. Okay, next up, I had a couple questions regarding um, sous vide, 
First up, I'll go over reverse searing versus sous vide for steaks. And Curl asked, is this seems like two extremely similar ways of meat coming up to temp. And yeah, they 1000% are. They're both looking to achieve the similar thing, which is slowly bringing whatever piece of meat you're cooking up to a certain temperature. Um, the big differences between them are sous vide in a bag. So that moisture is gonna be trapped in with the meat um, versus um, reverse searing such as a steak. It's out in the oven, it's open. So it's gonna dry off the surface area, which could help with better browning. Um, kind of the big differences between the two from a practicality standpoint are obviously you have to buy a sous vide machine. Um, and then for the reverse here, you just need an oven, which most, you know, everyone's kitchen has an oven. But if you do have, maybe if you're cooking for a larger crowd or maybe a, a, a family, um, I could see sous vide being much more practical um, just because, you know, you can set it on your counter. It's not taking up oven space if you have another dish going on. I mean, cause like when you're reverse searing, the, the steak is taking up the oven for, you know, maybe an hour or more at like, you know, 200 degrees. So it's like, you can't really cook anything else in there while you're using it. So that's when sous vide may be really good. And then also restaurants use it a ton because, you know, exactly for that same reason, the practicality, the functionality, they can have it sitting in baths on the counter. They don't have to worry about it. You know, it's, I mean, I would assume it probably uses less electricity. I don't actually know that for sure. Um, but I can definitely see the benefits of sous vide. It kind of just, it depends on your situation. Um, but again, it's a way to control temperature primarily. So I wouldn't say it's overhyped. It's just, does every home kitchen need to use it all the time? Or is it super helpful to have as a home cook? I would say probably not. Um, you know, I have one, I don't use it all the time. Um, but I recognize it definitely does have some benefits. So you kind of have to evaluate it on a case by case basis for sous vide. Next up, Chris Robb asks, what are some overlooked ingredients that can really enhance your cooking? So in my opinion, it's primarily like sauces or oils that you're adding kind of afterwards or at the table. So one thing that I've been adding a lot of is I have this jar, I actually think I just finished it, a jar of like peppers in oil. So I, sometimes I don't even use the peppers themselves, but I'll drizzle over just some of the oil and it has and carries those flavors. It's a little spicy. You know, this could be like chili oil in Chinese Queen, or if you've seen like Lao Gan Ma or Chili Crisp, those are becoming super popular. So oils like flavored oil, sesame oil, ingredients like that, super helpful. And then any type of acid in general. I mean, you guys have seen me use pickled onion liquid, pickled onions itself. Um, a little spritz of lemon or lime. And those additions really added at the end of a dish can really amplify it and take something from, you know, this is good to like, whoa, this is really, really good. It kind of helps cleanse the palate, makes it a little bit more interesting. So kind of those different flavored oils and then your acids are two ingredients that I say are often, often overlooked when cooking at home. All right, Middle Eats or Obi asks, what's the one piece of kitchen equipment that you'd tell your younger self to buy sooner? This one is so easy for me, and it's the right here, sharp knives, and then secondarily, a way to keep those knives sharpened, which for me is gonna be whetstones, which this is probably the real piece of equipment that I would say. I, I can't express how much of having a really sharp knife makes a difference in the kitchen. Not only is your prep just gonna be easier, but it literally makes it fun. Like I think I mentioned in the first question that I, I actually really do enjoy prepping vegetables. Um, and I think people who say they don't like prepping stuff or they say it takes a lot of time are people who have not used a sharp knife that was properly cared for and can just slice through things like a breeze. Looking back, I mean, even in some of my videos from early back, maybe a year or two ago, before I kind of got into knives and how to keep knives sharp, I like cringe at those videos because I know that feeling of basically mashing an onion versus truly slicing it. Um, so I, I can't express how much getting a quality knife and then getting a way to keep that sharp, whether you use whetstones, um, you know, there's a variety of ways that you can keep things sharp. Even just a honing rod will help keep everything lasting a lot longer. So definitely a sharp knife and a way to keep that thing sharp. It's, I, I can't express that much more. Mr. Sonny Lee asks, smash versus normal patties. So to this, I'm a smash patty guy. I love smash burgers. You guys know this. 
Um, I guess the big difference is like if I'm making them inside, I'm making a smash burger basically every single time. You can get super thin and crispy edges, so it's tons of browning in there. And then you can slide the cheese in, be in between, you know, your, your patties. So then you get that kind of gooey and like chewy mouth feel. Plus it just has that kind of nostalgia factor of like if you're going out to, you know, a fast food place, you can replicate that even better in your own home. Um, for normal patties, I guess kind of the cons of them are, yes, it's going to be tougher to get, you know, that nice browning and that crust on the outside but you can, you know, you can cook them to medium or medium rare, which kind of changes up the flavor profile, makes it a little bit more unctuous when you're biting through it. And then also they make them really good for grilling. You know, if you're doing a grill grate, you can't smash a smash patty on a grill grate, you know, it'll flip right through. So if I am grilling outside on like a charcoal grill, um, I would say normal patties, you know, cause those normal patties, they're going to get that charcoal flavor on there. But for me, if I'm making them inside, it's smash burgers, like, 99% of the time. Uh, next question, wash thyself as grilled cheese with mayo or butter? So I am team mayo, as you guys know. Um, I think it leads to better browning. I don't think it gives it a weird taste. Um, actually, one thing I have done with my grilled cheeses is spread them in a very thin layer of mayo to get the nice browning. And then after they're actually off, you can just give it a nice light rub with some butter, a stick of butter, and then it gets that buttery flavor if that's what you're going for. Um, but yeah, overall, I am team mayo for you know grilling up breads and things like that. I think it just gives much better and more even browning um, and nice and crispy, and, and that's really what I'm looking for. All right, next on the list, we have a spicy one. Uh, is Gordon Ramsay's cooking overrated? So. Gordon's an interesting one. I don't think he's a bad chef or anything. I think objectively he knows how to make very good food. I think that's clearly evident or else he, he would not have gotten popular, you know, wouldn't open restaurants and things like that. Um, I think where Gordon is overrated is the applicability to his content to like home cooks. You know, a lot of the times, even if it's like a, a quick dinner, it's like 20 ingredients that you're like, I, I don't have half of these in my kitchen, you know? So I think the applicability to the home cook is definitely overrated. It's it's more about the entertainment rather than, you know, I'm gonna look up a Gordon Ramsay recipe and make this. Um, and then another thing I would like to see, you know, I don't watch his stuff hardly ever, but um, him like learning stuff. I feel like a lot of times it's just like, I made this um, and he'll like say things, but like won't give you kind of, you know, sources or like where he learned it from. You know, maybe I'm just overlooking that fact. Um, but yeah, I think the, the applicability of Gordon to the home cook is the, portion that's overrated. Um, overall, you know, I think he's a good cook, but yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Next up, Cine asks, thoughts on culinary school, would you go if you could? So for me, I've loved cooking from a quite an early age, but I never thought about going to culinary school. Um, and now I wouldn't um, either go to culinary school. You know, I think it'd be cool to like be a fly on the wall in the classes, you know, maybe do it as like a part-time thing, like just go in and whatever, just to learn things and see what it's like. Um, but I think if you're getting into food, I mean, you know, there's tons of ways that you can get into food and get to where you want to be without going to, you know, culinary school. And this is kind of what I think too, in just college in general or, or things like that. Like you don't have to go get a signified degree to get to places you want to go. And I know a lot of people can probably speak much better on this than I can. I know um, Molly Boz, for example, she never went to culinary school, but she's a great example of someone who has made it in the food industry without that. And I think she's spoken on that before that you don't need to. Um, you know, it could definitely help depending on kind of what your trajectory is, but I think you should have a very clear notion of what you're looking to get out of culinary school before you actually decide to go. Don't kind of, you know, say, hey, I'm just gonna go to culinary school and figure it out on the way. I would try to have a pretty clear path and then if culinary school helps you get there, then I think it's worthwhile. Otherwise, I would say, no, like figure out how to make food work for you. If that's working in bakeries, a restaurant, whatever, get the experience that you wanna get out of it. Or if you're someone like me, you know, home cook, I just wanted to be self-taught. I wanted to learn stuff kind of on my own and experiment things. Um, so I think there's many ways to do it. I don't think culinary school is necessary, but um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't go, but at the end of the day, that's all up to you. 
All right, this is a question that I like from Eric Granado. If you order more than two toppings, you like toppings, not pizza. Same with burgers. So this is a good question that I have definitely been swinging and kind of thinking about over the past time. So right now when I make pizzas, like I do them pretty simply. So if you guys saw like the, the weeknight pizza, it's like a garlicky, um, spicy weeknight sauce with just cheese, extra garlic and things like that. Or, you know, if I'm doing like meat on a pizza, it's like pepperonis and just um, onions or maybe some other kind of interesting thing. Cause I think pizza can get really lost when you are just throwing a ton of stuff on. And there is a time and place for that type of pizza, right? Like if you're just trying to finish out stuff in your fridge, it's like throw all these vegetables on, throw cheeses, throw meats, throw chicken, and you're kind of just like making a large meal out of it. Um, but over time, I've, I've started to become much more intentional, um, kind of like what Eric is, is getting at here with what I'm putting on my pizza because I want all the components to shine. And I want those toppings that I do put on, I want them to be very noticeable. I want the garlic to really come through and then I maybe wanted that to play with, you know, roasted red peppers or something like that. So if you're making pizza next time, think about the toppings you want to throw on there. And then this is the same with burgers, as he mentioned. I don't like burgers with lots of toppings. I'm pretty simple, you know, give me two patties, cheese, give me pickled onions, lettuce, um, maybe a little bit of sauce to help bring that all together, make it moist and stuff. But I don't want things like, uh, I don't want onion rings on my burger. I don't want like a bunch of like curly straw fries. I don't want like tons of avocado or, or things of that nature. So this is something that I do agree with. Less toppings, the better. Let the burger shine, let the pizza shine on its own, and then use those toppings to just amplify it and make it a little bit more interesting than it would be without them. So Trent Skillet asks the one, does pineapple belong on pizza? So you can put whatever you want on your pizza, but for me, it does not belong on pizza. I think in general, warm pineapple applications on just about anything I'm not a fan of. I don't like them on burgers. I don't like warm pineapple. I don't really like grilled pineapple. I just, something about warm pineapple I'm just not down with. Um, I'll eat cold pineapple, you know, just straight up, or obviously maybe in, in uh, salsas or things like that, it can be interesting or a little maybe mixed with herbs and whatnot. But yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a warm pineapple person. I just, any dish where I have warm pineapple on it, I'm gonna be like, I wish the pineapple wasn't here. So I think I just got like two or three questions left, but the Mighty Morphin Flower asks, it seems like you place a big emphasis on adaptability in your recipes, why? So this is something that I like to kind of focus on and kind of show connections between recipes. Like if you wanna make something healthier, you wanna make something fattier, you wanna make something faster, you wanna make something that works for you and your schedule. Because I think that's really the problem that we're trying to solve as people that cook at home. You know, you need to figure out what foods fit into your life or else, and how they fit in, or else you're not gonna end up cooking at home. If you don't kind of see those pathways, you're gonna, you're gonna order out, you're gonna do whatever, but once you realize that, you know, for example, like pizza dough, I showed how it fit into my schedule on a particular night, but you could also started that like the day before, you could have done it as your le at your leisure to make it fit your schedule the best way that it can. And then, you know, also making things, you know, maybe a little bit lower calorie or just figuring out those various way that you can pull on the strings of like a base recipe and kind of make it your own to fit your schedule, your needs. I think that's the, that's the problem as like a home cook that you really need to solve. So that's why I always place a big emphasis on that and kind of show you and maybe show you a direction to go and then you can kind of take it from there um, however you want to. So the last two questions are kind of related to appliances. Uh, first up, Shea High Mask, are Instapots and air fryers worthwhile? And I don't personally have an Instapot or an air fryer, but I think 1000% they can be right for a lot of people's home kitchens. Um, this kind of goes back to the prior question where you know Instapots, they reduce the time amount that you need to spend on various dishes. Same with air fryers, you don't need to preheat the oven. You can also make smaller amounts, which is really good for maybe one to four people and things like that nature. Um, that being said, like all the stuff you can do in an Instapot or an air fryer, you can do with your oven. You know, if your oven's got convection setting, that's the same technology going on there. Instapots, they speed up time with, you know, putting things under pressure and whatnot. 
Um, but if you have the time, again, you can do all the same things. But I think that's what ties in to that prior question. Like I was saying is, you need to figure out kind of what works for you in your kitchen. Do Instapots and air fryers help you cook more or make cheaper meals, healthier meals, whatever it is, they fit your lifestyle, they fit your schedule. And 1000% if they fit and they help you, like I'm all on board. So yeah, I would say totally they're worthwhile. It just kind of depends on your situation. And then last up, we have Rank Your Appliances from Thomas. So I really don't have many appliances at all. I think I have, I've got a Vitamix. Um, I have another small food processor. I have a kettle. Um, and then I have an immersion blender. Let me... I think that's literally it. So three of those are blending things. Um, if I could only pick one of those blending things, it would 1000% be the Vitamix just because that gives you the highest variability and also can create some really like smooth purees and things like that. It's probably the most useful, but obviously that's just a lot bigger. Um, so you generally need to do larger quantities of things. And then, I mean, my electric kettle, I guess I just use for like coffee and things like that, or like for boiling pasta water. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't think, I don't think I really have any other appliances. Um, the microwave, I guess. I, so I, I have a microwave. Again, it's like outside of my kitchen. I don't use it that often. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I would rather have, le oh, a sous, sous vide machine too. So sous vide, again, I kind of talked on that earlier. Not something I use all the time. I use it from time to time. Um, but yeah, for me, I kind of like less appliances um, just because I don't like clutter and either have to store them inside places so I like to keep my counters clean of appliances and whatnot. But yeah, I don't think I really have many more appliances than that. Um, but with that being said, that's gonna wrap up the Q&A guys. Hopefully you have enjoyed. Um, thanks again for everything over the past like 14 months. It's literally been crazy. Um, things, I'm not sure video schedule, it might take a week or two to get kind of back into the flow of things once I move back to the East Coast. Um, but I've got some cool content coming. Uh, really cool stuff probably in the next like five to six months and then after that we've got some big plans um, for this channel so hopefully you guys are enjoying the ride with me um, hopefully you guys are learning something um, as always you know follow the socials just follow along see what we're going on we'll, we'll keep cooking cool things want to get back into some more regional um, dishes and exploring some more cuisines and techniques and things like that so thanks for listening along I'll catch you guys all in the next one peace